Hello, uh, apologies for the delay. I just got lost back and forth around the Qatar National Convention Center. Uh, it's a little bit late, but it's going to be a fun session, hopefully. I just want to give you a quick overview of... Can I welcome you? Oh, I mean, I just <laughs> wanted to go. I thought you already done it. No, I did not. I did not. Sorry. I mean, again, uh, thank you, thank you, Barish, for being here. Barish actually is a senior director in Intel Capital for the Middle East, Turkey, Africa. Yes. All right. Great. Am I missing any geographical area? Yeah. That was the whole emer <laughs> emerging innovation great. center. So, uh, great having him with us. Actually, Intel Capital, I mean, he would be uh, more capable of presenting it. Uh, more than me, but I mean, Intel Capital has been there for long, and not so many of our entrepreneurs know that there is an investment arm in startups, in technology startups, that's owned by Intel. So, uh, with no further ado, I would like to, to leave the floor for Barish. Thank you, Barish, again for being okay, here. Thanks with for us. the intro again. Thanks for having me. All right, so I know I'm late, so I want to go fast, and I want to make it as interactive as possible. If you have any questions, hopefully we're going to go through that more than um, talking about Intel Capital for half an hour. So um, we are Intel's venture arm. Uh, we do invest in technology companies anywhere in the world, from any stage and anything under the IT umbrella. I'm going to tell a little bit more about that, but if you look at any financial institutions, their main, their sole purpose is to make money for their LPs. And what we do at Intel Capital, we layer on top of financial returns, we also help companies to bring strategic impact for Intel. And that's our purpose. Um, we do, again, as I mentioned, we do write checks anywhere from $200,000 seed stage deal to $200 million pipe deal into a public company. Um, we uh, last month we've done a 750 million dollar investment into a software company in the valley called Cloudera, which is a big data company. Uh, and that same month we also do a 200 thousand uh, dollar software startup in Russia. So anywhere between those, we are fairly active and agile to be able to do those deals. Um, we um, have presence pretty much all around the world and we have invested in around 55 countries so far um, and I as uh, Matt mentioned I've covered Turkey Middle East and Africa trying to look for opportunities in technology space anywhere again from seed stage deals to all the way up to later stage companies again our bread and butter though it's five million to fifty million dollar checks while we also write seed stage and also big deals like 750 million. Um, as I mentioned, we do invest anywhere under the IT umbrella, meaning starting from all the way from technology manufacturing to internet and enterprise software companies. And we found, again, the technology and manufacturing is fairly strategic for Intel. And whereas on the other end of the spectrum, you have companies, internet companies, media companies, gaming companies, where we still think it has a bigger impact in the company. Again, if you think about that, most of your devices and most of those services run on the cloud and, um, and those devices will all need chips. So the way we look at it is we either go very strategic all the way down to technology and manufacturing and go all the way up to the application stack to invest into services companies. Um, so what we look for when we are uh, looking for investments around the world? I mean, obviously, the number one area that we try to look for is disruptive technologies. What are the changes in the technology landscape? Again, on the previous slide, we're talking about new areas like, you know, uh, wearables, Internet of Things. Um, again, there is a lot of stuff going on in education, in digital media. So these are all the areas that we're looking for a disruptive technology, new usage model, how um, students at schools are now utilizing tablets. Is there are adap adaptive learning platforms. I mean, you go to healthcare, there's a lot of things happening with the wearables and Internet of Things where you could real-time monitor an elderly person in a house, and if there's any problem, you could 
pretty much to the first uh, first diagnostic all the way from the hospital rather than going into the house or sending an ambulance and bringing down the patient. So there's a lot of things going on there. And all those new technologies are definitely very interesting for us. And again, as I mentioned, every deal we do has a strategic link to Intel. And most of those areas are fairly strategic for us. We do a lot of things, but we want to make sure the entrepreneur and the company has a good alignment with Intel. Um, again, like any investor says, um, solid management team is very important at the end of the day. We help those companies to become bigger and uh, more innovative, but the entrepreneurial team, the management team is the one who is going to execute. So we want to make sure the management team is fairly strong, potentially have maybe domain expertise, have a solid team of you know technologists, marketers and salespeople in the team already. If not, we'll happy to help, but it will be great to have a strong management team. And um, while these are all good, again, any investor, the number one thing they will look for is the large market, either existing large market or a fast growing market that is going to be large. When we first started the application, investing into mobile applications, I mean, that was a fairly small, fairly small market but it was probably one of the fastest growing markets within the mobile space, and now it comes up to multi-billion dollar market. You have multi-billion dollar markets are being created. I mean, Uber today is raising at 17 billion valuation, which is operating mainly on a mobile app, right? It's so we really look for a large market or and or a fast growing market where we could eventually exit from our companies, and that's the last point which is the exit opportunities where we want to make sure we'll be able to exit either in terms of an acquisition, merger and acquisition, or go bringing the company to public. So, um, I mean, we could make this interactive. I mean, there's no format, I think. Ahmed didn't tell me anything. So if you have any questions, just ask during the process rather than waiting a half an hour. Um, yeah, we do invest pretty much around anywhere in the world. We put $11 billion to work so far. We have multiple funds into specific areas. We have funds to specific domains, like we have a $100 million connected fund. We have an education fund. We have an uh, Ultrabook fund. We have uh, recently a connected devices, a Internet of Things fund. And we do also have some um, uh, regional area, regional funds. But the key point I want to make is we have pretty much no boundaries to be able to invest in anywhere, any stage, as long as it falls under one of the technology areas that we're looking for. Uh, this is over 2013 and also the historical score chart, if you will. I mean, this is, we are fairly active investors. We usually put around $300 million every year. I mean, every single year, and we've been pretty consistent about that. Last year, we've done 333 investment, and uh, uh, sorry, 63 of them were new, and the rest were our follow-ons, meaning investing into our existing companies to support them and grow them along the path. Uh, we are fairly active in the exit markets. Um, we had around 33 exits last year, and that's a fairly large number for any technology fund. We've been recently selected as the number one VC investment uh, firm, having uh, had the highest number of exits, both for the M&A and also on the IPO track. These are some of the companies we've done. Just to give you an idea, Snapdeal is one of the largest e-commerce platform in India, which is was a fairly large deal. We don't disclose the size, but it was fairly large, double-digit number. Clinkle, on the other hand, it's a seed stage deal in Stanford. Uh, it's a mobile app, mobile payment app using ultra ultrasound. Uh, we have Thalmic Labs again, another Series A deal, which is. Uh, wearable device where you can wear a band and you'll be able to control your drones or your gaming devices. So we do again invest in anywhere in the stack in terms of technology and also in terms of stage. So Clinkle, seed deal versus snap deal, which is a fairly late deal.
And these are our exits in terms of IPOs on the right at hand. VCube was in the Japan, it's a fairly large exit. Yumi is an IPO video advertising company. And these are the exits we have where um, we sold it to a, a, a larger organization, it, it, like mostly in US, but some of them are, um, some of them are outside of US, dealmates in Malaysia, for example. Um, and again, we've been doing this for a while, so we have fairly big names under our logo chart here. Uh, I've got a question for you. Yeah, sure. Um, obviously, as a major investor, you are there. It's great to see. But within the digital and tech industries... Sorry, Leslie, can you... Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, obviously, ooh, that's loud, isn't it? Hello? Um, obviously, it's great to see the investment that you're putting in here globally, but uh, with the digital and tech industries, you obviously have to budget for a significant failure rate, which is obviously in, in terms of the new businesses and skill sets coming up, is invaluable to get that. So, how does Intel deal with that side of it when you're actually looking to invest in new innovation? Is it a fail rate, you mean? Yeah. I mean, it's whoever is investing in this business, either as a corporate or as an institutional investor, fail the rate is part of the game. I mean, you will have companies that will fail. And um, rather than, I would say, digital media versus, you know, software or hardware, which mainly, it's more to do with the stage. So the seed deals or the series A deals, we see more failing, right? Because they are fairly early, higher risk. So you take a lot of risk at that point. You take team risk. Right? The yep. team may not get along, they may not be able to form a team. Um, you have market risk, you have technology risk, you have product risk, you have scaling risk. You take all those at that level and one of them may blow and you know, it, may go, it may not go anywhere. So on the later time. stage, on the other hand, like, yeah. it's a fairly large business, it's not going to go fail. Snapdeal is a multi-hundred million dollar revenue company, so it's more likely it's not going to fail. Yeah. But um, yeah, can we make money off that? That's the other financial piece of it. So in a market like Qatar, which is emerging and is obviously setting up, as you can see around us, lots of great new businesses starting here. I mean, obviously they, they need a lot more support at this stage. And it's obviously, I assume Intel's here, so that's the sort of thing that you're interested in in, in terms of investment here as well. So, um, I mean, we're looking at multiple things here. I mean, like, if there are early stage companies, this is my first time in Qatar. I would love to meet entrepreneurs and trying to see what they are up to. Um, I mean, in Qatar, I'm assuming there are going to be more earlier stages. And I might, I mean, I bet there are later stage companies, but I think the number, I would love to hear your thoughts too. It's, I would assume the early stage is going to be the bigger piece. So in that side, I mean, the key parts we're going to be looking for is, is this a solid team going after a large market under one of those technology areas that we're looking for? If that is, it's a fairly interesting point for us. I mean, the, I mean, the underlying theme at Intel Capital is the innovation could come anywhere. It doesn't need to be only in US or Europe or China. And I'll show a, a pie chart showing where our money goes around the world. It comes up anywhere. So we did a seed deal in Russia, who is doing a, a, speed, a speech recognition engine. So um, it's a fairly early stage company. We'll see where it's going to go. But the guys in Russia, which are fairly young two guys, created an amazing technology that is going to go compete with Nuance, which is a fairly large US corporation. I mean, there is innovation everywhere, and I assume, I assume it will be here too. I'd love to meet and try to get a better understanding. I mean, you guys, have you been here for a while? Um, yeah, I've been coming since 2009. So what do you see? I see it very exciting. I think that but, uh, what's happening here is quite unique, I think, in the region. It's all starting, there's a lot of things starting from the grassroots upwards. I mean, obviously, financially, they can enter the market at any point. But I think they have um, high levels of education in Qatar and they have a great opportunity to skill that entrepreneurialism and investment to, great, to, to create some great innovation and digital content products. Yeah, I mean, it's when at the beginning of the ecosystem, usually there's a lot of hand holding to be done. If there is enough talent and if there are enough engineers and you know, the sales and marketing, marketing acumen present here, I think the rest is really executing a playbook which has been done. I mean, Right next to you, there's a guy sitting, Murat. He's done that in New York. So Murat started an incubation accelerator uh, platform in New York when there was no one hanging out and doing anything in technology in New York. And now, 
How many companies do you have right now? Seven. Seven zero. Seven to companies. Eh? Again, you need those kind of incubation centers, accelerators, whatever you will call. I mean, it, that terminology is keep getting mixed now. But it's you need those here to kind of flourish that. Um, and then hopefully investors are going to kick in. But before the accelerators, you need to have the talent base. And yeah. it sounds like you've seen a lot of interesting stuff here. So it's probably a matter of time before you start to see more investments into the technology yeah. part. So um, I'll keep going. So what do we do uh, in terms of company building? Again, capital is everywhere. And again, I think this, we are living in an era where there's an abundance of capital pretty much in any stage. Uh, maybe it's not distributed around the world well, uh, balanced, but there is a lot of capital looking for companies in technology segments. So how do we differentiate ourselves? Again, as I mentioned early on, while we look at for financial returns, we also look for strategic impact. And to create that impact, we pretty much do a lot of hands-on involvement with the company from customer introduction. So we can, what we do is we have a concept called Intel Technology Days where we bring our companies in front of the right people at Fortune 1000 companies around the world from Procter & Gamble, Visa, MasterCard, to Germany, to BMW, and go to China Telecom, to soft, uh, uh, SoftBank in Japan. So what we do is, you know, we talk to those guys. We have a 15-person business development team. Their sole purpose is to help our portfolio companies. So we talk to these Fortune 1000 companies, and they called us, hey, we are having challenges in mobile and mobile CRM or app or big data or social media marketing or you know education digital education and then they tell us okay why don't you guys bring 10 or 15 of your portfolio companies and we bring the right people in the room we spend the whole day so what happens in those meetings is usually uh, in within the 12 months you see most of the time a contract and again I experienced that from the companies that I invested in in my portfolio companies and uh, uh, it's a major impact, and for a small, you know, for a small company and about unknown entrepreneur in Russia to be able to go talk to the CIO at BMW, who is thinking about putting a speech recognition technology into the car. So this is a fairly big value add that we bring to the companies. Again. Being Intel, we have a lot of engineers ourselves, and we do a lot of things from patents to technology development, and and also sometimes steering the standard organizations. And that technology expertise, we try to transfer or share uh, with our portfolio companies as much as possible. Again, there are always gray zones where we can and they cannot, so we want to make sure they collaborate as much as possible to get that kind of expertise, tra expertise transfer on both sides. And um, in terms of company building, um, again, the companies, got, even though every company is unique, I think whoever you talk to will tell that every company has a unique problem, unique situation, but seeing as many deals as we do, having done as many deals as we've done, there are some similarities in terms of building a team, scaling a company, launching a product, going international, doing a business deal with a telco. Um, so that expertise really helps us to guide the entrepreneurs before they get to a certain problem, before they get to a certain stage. So they found it fairly valuable. Um, and in terms of the M&A piece, again, we do pretty much the probably most active exit market, exit, uh, having seen an exit in around the world uh, in technology space. So that expertise gives us a lot of contacts in the corporate development. Uh, corp dev side to the bankers to the auditors to the lawyers and things like that and we've seen again last year we've seen 33 exits so meaning we've seen a lot of you know shareholder agreements deals where you know stock purchase agreement deals where we know what the corp dev guy on the other end is looking for and what the entrepreneur should watch out for Again, these are fairly complicated and sophisticated negotiation process and any kind of expertise that really helps them because it, while we went through 33 times last year, that entrepreneur that we are working with probably have never had it in his life. So all that discussions, all that terminology, all that you know negotiation tactics that he's doing as he goes. And again, in an M&A process, you need to be fairly diligent because you may be leaving a lot of money on the table. Because on the other side, there's a corp dev, corp dev executive where his or her 
job, daily job, is to buy deals. So they are fairly experienced, experienced people. And again, the marketing, marketing resources is to be able to help our companies around the world on the ground because Intel has offices in 155, I think, countries. So we use our sales and marketing teams around the world to help navigate our entrepreneurs if they want to go expand into those areas. So this is the technology days that I was talking about. You know, these are some of the logos that we work with. Again, these guys, you know, keep calling us, and we work them very closely. Warner Bros. Warner Bros. is um, fairly, for example, a uh, uh, close alliance uh, uh, ally for us on the digital media area. There's a lot of things going on in terms of streaming. There's a lot of things going on video advertising around gaming. We work very closely with them. BMW is another one. They do a lot of things in the cars. They keep, you know, telling us about, you know, asking about us about interesting technologies around mobile, around big data, how they could build location-based services into the car, how they can tie it to the mobile phone. So there's a lot of things going on there. Um, and also we do every year a global summit, in, uh, usually in US. Um, this year is November 3rd in Huntington Beach in California. So we try to bring what we do again is we work for our entrepreneurs. We bring all our entrepreneurs there. And along with that, we bring a lot of industry executives around the world to make sure they spend time with our portfolio companies. The key idea is really to, net, to make sure our entrepreneurs network with the right people for three days and have a bunch of educational sessions or generic things like, you know, how to hire a VP of sales or how to, what kind of equity should they give them, what should be the salary, how to fire a CTO, right? You know, there's a lot of this common stuff that the entrepreneurs will love to hear from someone and also talk to each other because they each have a lot of expertise and they, it's trying to create a sharing, a information sharing, expertise sharing platform for it. Um, and one other part, I think the last point, it's um, one other thing that we do for portfolio companies is, is our global investment syndicate. Again, as um, the average time in US from start to exit is around eight years. So it takes eight years to company from start to bring to an exit, either IPO or m and in average. So not everything is Instagram and gets sold in a year. So during that eight years, you usually need not only one round of financing, but you need multiple rounds of financing. In US, this is a little bit easier because there is a lot of access, there is a major access to capital in different stages. But in other parts of the world, it's not that easy to get access to the capital. So if you're a Series A company, you do execute well, or you know you miss certain milestones maybe, but you will need a Series B to scale out of the country that you're in. So how are you going to bring that Series B? So we have multiple uh, 30 plus syndicate members around the world. These are the top investors in their regions, and we bring them along with our deals. We share our deals flow. We have pre-signed agreements with these guys. So if we have a deal looking for a Series B, we go to these guys first. All right, this is the company in you know Qatar looking for maybe Series B for their digital education platform. And uh, so getting the guys in China, the guys in Russia, the guys in US to look at it and be able to participate in the round. The whole idea is to make the entrepreneur's life easy to get the capital, focus on the business. Um, so that was the distribution I was talking about. Again, um, Middle East is still not getting a big chunk of the money yet. <laughs> uh, but um, it is bigger than, uh, for us at least, China and Latin America, the amount of money that we deploy into the region. Uh, that includes, you know, MENA, Central Eastern Europe, and Russia. Um, so the bigger chunk of the, uh, our investments is go so this is 2013 so we invested 333 million so half of it almost went to us and the rest was split around different regions again asia pacific excluding china is getting a big piece so that includes japan taiwan um, you know but uh, now emerging countries like indonesia malaysia vietnam and uh, Western Europe is still getting a big chunk too, and dominantly driven by you know the uh, the Eng Englands of the world, Germany's, and uh, now increasingly Northern Europe, Finland, uh, especially in gaming. And uh, then the next up is really Middle East, uh, Central Eastern Europe, and Russia. Uh, so uh, this is, I think this is my last slide. So happy to answer any questions or. Let me know if you have any questions. 
Can I ask you another one? Yeah, sure. Um, I've been actually, it's quite interesting, you know, in terms of a lot of the models, I was at GDC in California a couple of months ago. Last year? Uh, yeah, no, this year. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, very good. Um, I, I run a big, um, both an event, but also an initiative in the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. With regard to video gaming, taking it from 11 years in education right through to outputs of video game companies. Um, I know you, I'm just delighted that you referenced the gaming industry twice within this, because I think that uh, one of the key areas within Qatar is that there is a, a huge interest for video games. And we have Ganas just over here, who are making great video games. So just as a personal thing, how, how do you actually see the, the rise of the mobile device and, and um, the opportunities that are going to arise through gaming and gamification globally? Um, yeah, I mean, I love gaming. And I've done multiple investments in gaming, and it's been very profitable for us. Um, we, I mean, the, there's a major disruption going on in every industry. And I think wherever industry you're working on, it's getting right now disrupted by social and mobile, and potentially with the big data, right? It's, um, there are a lot of big companies being formed around each of this disruption, and mobile is one of them. And I reference Uber, but within gaming, the whole distribution channel has been disrupted. Before you develop two years of game, you know uh, the titles, and then go to one of the distributors to come out and make sure put your game into the shelves, or you go through the EAs of the world to kind of publish you. But that whole system got disrupted with Facebook first. Then you got companies like Zynga formed up, and then sudden, I mean, that was a fairly short period of time where you create Zynga-like companies, which is multi-billion dollars. Uh, even though it got criticized, but again, you know, it started in, I think, 08. In six years, you're creating a multi-billion dollar gaming company. It's fairly impressive. And now, what's happening is with the mobile, the whole distribution channel is again changed. Now, Zynga's of the world, which was just created, and now trying to find how to get in front of the users, and companies like, you know, Supercell, or Rovio, or Candy Crush, King.com, has, has been created. The, so you really need to understand the distribution channel because at the end of the day, um, the gaming has the gaming piece either has been evolving in terms of the casual MMORPGs, the later stage hardcore games, but the distribution channel changed a lot. So how do you get to those users? And the economics from, you know, you pay the game and then play to free to play and pay within the game, free to play model has been fairly dominant. So it creates a lot of interesting opportunities. I mean, Candy Crush, is an amazing game. So their 2012 revenues is, I think, around $180 million. 2013 revenues is $1.8 billion. In a year, they 10x the revenue. I'm not sure where else you see this. Um, it's, I mean, again, there are other challenges, like, you know, how do you create other, other hits? But it's a very profitable area if you do it well. And again, since we're from UK, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I, I have an incubation there for the video game companies predominantly. And I mean, one of, one of the teams that we built up just looking at the Xbox One being here today, I mean, um, using that device, they're pushing very much into the indie market because they're finding that there's greater success here for startup businesses um, with the mobile device. So they were one of the only 20 companies that uh, Microsoft picked to showcase at Xbox at GDC this year. Because That's of the fact impressive. That, yeah, because of the fact that it's got a, a cross-platform approach, so you can play it on any of the devices. And I guess that this is the model that is going to increasingly go forward over the next year or two. And so for a market like Kata, it's the perfect timing for it because, the, you know, in terms of growing up from the grassroots, you've got a lot of younger businesses, their opportunities of getting product to market are greater probably now than ever. Yeah. I mean, is there any gaming entrepreneurs here or how many people are entrepreneurs here? Faraj. Faraj. Barish is asking if there is a gaming entrepreneur over here. Well, here's a very a brilliant young gaming entrepreneur, ah. actually from Qatar, so here you nice. are. Nice. Yes. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Please, uh, again... It's a great opportunity. You're going to pitch it in like 10 seconds. Yeah, what do you what, do? What, what yeah. do you think the opportunities yeah. are for gaming here in Qatar? Well, first of all, I apologize. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, I believe it has a very big potential. Uh, the market okay. is still uh, green. I, as you can, we call it a green field, so uh, no one is there at the moment. Uh, there is a lot of, a big, a very big potential to be exploited. Um, and yeah, there is a lot of uh, small, very minor initiatives that are, uh, uh, you know, 
basically what I want to say is, is, is the, that the very serious investors that are, are the very serious initiatives that are there out in the MENA region are probably uh, a number of, of, of uh, companies that you can count in a single hand. So uh, there is no, there is no a lot of uh, big companies uh, going in that area. There are a few initiatives I'm saying, but not really serious. Yeah. So I mean, one big problem in the gaming investment, though, is or challenge, I should say, is there is the hit nature, right? Yes. It's yes. that makes it very risky for all of us. So as an investor, you just want to say, let's see if it's gonna work, and. You try to invest right before it's picking up, but every company almost at the beginning, they all look like similar, right? They're all growing and there's that tipping point where they start going up and you got to pick it for me. At least my job is to pick right before you go up. Yes, I agree. And uh, basically it's an R&D nature, so uh, you have to research a lot and suddenly you, you will find out uh, that one of your research, uh, it's, it's your hit. Yeah, let's chat after this. Is there any other question? Okay. Yeah, hello. Um, as an investor, I can understand that the uh, investors Sorry. always find, uh, trying to find an exit. But what do you prefer, finding an exit or expand with the company and to what limits? Uh, I mean, it's, there is a natural, um, I think, point where the entrepreneur wants to take it to an exit. So, so one of the differences I forgot to mention, thanks for the question, is we don't have uh, a time limitation in terms of getting out of a deal. A lot of the funds have certain investment period and then harvesting time. For us, we have no constraints around when we want to get out. So we have one company uh, called Smart Technologies. It's an education company started by a husband and wife uh, entrepreneur out of Canada. They started in 93. I think we invested in them 95 or something like that. And we bring them, to, so they so the company got big and they expand and in 2010 entrepreneurs wanted to go to uh, to an exit so we hired a banker and we did all that stuff so the company went public in New York Stock Exchange in 2010 after 15 years but so there's a natural kind of the point where the entrepreneur is like okay we got a two billion dollar offer we should sell so and then we don't say no <laughs> Uh, but you know we never pressure because at the end of the day it's the entrepreneur who might really build a big company as you just mentioned so you help the entrepreneurs to sell the share like if they reach a, a proper uh, yeah we help them to work to, to run through the process again we are not going to sell ourselves but we will make sure they work with the right banker for that specific company because every banker has talent into specific regions specific themes specific stage so we want to make sure they work with the right people navigate through the process and if everyone decides to sell, then we sell. I mean, we'd never pressure anyone to go after an exit. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to ask again about the 5% in the Middle East. Why is it that way? Is it like there is no focus on the Middle East to invest by the capital, or is there not enough pitches from the region that qualifies for your investment? Um, I mean, I think it's more the latter, but it's combination in one sense because I moved. Uh, I'm, I used to be in San Francisco. I moved to Istanbul, covering this region, to, in late 2012. And um, before then, there was a colleague of mine. I think he's been looking at it for two, three years. So it's very new. Uh, whereas in US, we've been doing it for 20 years, right? Invest in Europe is probably 10 plus years. So it's new. It's coming up. So there is that. But on the other hand, we don't see enough deals as we see in Silicon Valley, right? We see way many more deals um, than what we see in Silicon Valley. So that's uh, in Silicon Valley. So that's why a uh, certain percentage of them gets closed. That gets to a five-person number. What do you do with the companies here? Do you invest in them wherever they are incorporated or about to get incorporated depending on the country they were in? Or do you actually prefer U.S. laws and move move them to San Francisco or somewhere else? We don't care. I mean, we don't care. Uh, the entrepreneur should do the best for the company, whatever makes most sense. We can invest in any form. I mean, there are certain things we cannot, but pretty much any legal structure, we should be able to invest. <laughs> <laughs>